seminar, and this is Professor Malvida Das from the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, Mo, uh, she did her PhD in the Institute, Indian Institute of Science, and later postdoc at Harvard, UCLA, and three months at that university in Amsterdam. And this year, Mo was elected a uh, fellow of the American Physical Society for her work on some materials, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, Mo is also a very active member of the soft matter and biology computer community. I met her in 2020 when she apparently started some online seminar that kind of brought back life to the community um, when the troubles were kind of solved because of the pandemic. And she continues running that as a seminar like tw twice a week, two speakers. Once a week. Once a week, two speakers. Uh, and then the seminar is hosted online and there's some uh, opportunity. Um, very good resource for students, so you can check that out and do it yourself. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Nouris, for the invitation. I have one quick question before I go ahead and say anything. Should I try to condense my talk? Do we have to get out of this thing, or should I just give whatever we I had? OK, OK, all right. All right, so it's a pleasure to be here. I was actually, last time and first time I was in Boulder was two decades ago for a Boulder summer school in Kinesis Matter and Materials Physics, my first year of grad school. And now I'm here 20 years later. It's a pleasure to be here to give this physics colloquium. And in case, you know, if this is too short for this, I'm going to be back as a lecturer for this year's Boulder Summer School, so we'll have even more chance to chat, right? So my research is mainly in, in you know, uh, uh, concerns uh, network-like soft materials in biological systems and also now in synthetic biology. And what are sort of the physics rules or laws or concepts that make these materials robust and resilient, you know, so that's the kind of work I do. And I'm going to tell you about some uh, ongoing work in my group on, on these kinds of questions today, right? So I will mainly focus on sort of biopolymer networks in our cells and tissues, and then a new work on, on circadian colloids, and you'll see what that is. And I'm going to skip this. This is, I like to show my students and collaborators who were involved uh, before the talk, just in case I don't get a chance to talk about them later. But you know, hopefully I will get a chance to talk about them later. So the names are blue. In blue are postdocs and students who were involved in the work I'm going to talk about. And these are the experimental. So I'm a theorist and a modeler. But all of the work I do is in collaboration, is in close collaboration with experimental colleagues. And these are the experimental colleagues uh, who are sort of involved in the kinds of things I'm going to talk about today. And OK, so you know, living materials, or the materials, if you think of living systems as materials, they are very active, robust, resilient materials. This is probably sort of the most famous biophysics movie that there is. You know, it's got millions of views on YouTube. So basically, we have a white blood cell, which is chasing a bacteria relentlessly, and it's pushing the red blood cells out of its way as it does this, right? And this white blood cell, not only is it, is it relentless, right? It also can sort of change its shape and remodel, right? So that it can squeeze through narrow regions. It can also sort of generate forces so to sort of push the uh, red blood cells out of its way as it goes through. So then you can ask, why is this cell at the same time squishy and able to remodel, but at the same time, it maintains its physical integrity, right? And it's quite robust. And then this is my other favorite example at a completely different level of a soft living material that can take the shape of things that it gets in, and again, is very robust and, and resilient, right? So, so then you can ask, you know, why are sort of how do living systems create materials that are you know active? So basically, they are generating forces, right? And they are, are robust and resilient at the same time. Can we make sort of artificial materials, artificial soft materials that recapitulate some of these properties? Can we sort of activate these kinds of artificial uh, materials using biological properties, uh, uh, biological processes? Can we sort of uh, endow them with tunability, programmability, and so on? And then also, how do we sort of map uh, micro scale sort of structures to meso and macro scale uh, functions and properties, right? And and you know and you know many of us think the best way to sort of understand something is to sort of you know build it from the bottom up. So a lot of the stuff I do involves you know sort of bottom up approaches, and 
So then you can ask, well, how can we build up something, right, bottom up, uh, you know, that will have these kinds of, you know, robustness, resilience, uh, 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 these kinds of properties of, of, you know, living material. So what will a synthetic biology system look like? Uh, you might think. You might think this is what it looks like. I guess I'm dating myself. Many of you were probably born after this. Does everybody recognize what this is? OK. So one of the cells that actually comes close to this is a cell system that one of my collaborators works with. And this is sort of a terminator sort of thing in a biological system. So this is the single cell ciliate called Stentor ceruleus. It's found, it's a freshwater organism found in ponds. And the cool thing about stentor is if you try to apply mechanical trauma in it, you can't really damage it easily. If you make holes in it, it will close the hole. If you chop it into bits, so long as each bit has a part of the nucleus, it will make a new stentor. So in that sense, it's a little bit like you know, uh, the Terminator, but, but maybe it's not, it's not going to take over our world. But anyway, so what can we learn from these kinds of biological systems you know, about, about the sort of biophysics rules of robustness and resilience and so on, right? So coming back to sort of the kinds of things that I'm interested in, we can think about, OK, so what are these kinds of systems made of, of right? That you know, give them their physical integrity and, and rigidity, but at the same time allow them to sort of remodel and reconfigure and sort of you know, adapt to, to uh, whatever context that they're facing, right? So then you can ask, OK, so what are sort of our cells and tissues made up of? So we, for example, the reason we have our form and our structure is because of our skeleton, right? So we all know this. So similarly, cells also have a skeleton, so the cytoskeleton. But unlike our skeleton, the cytoskeleton is actually very sort of, you know, it's constantly sort of, uh, uh, sort of reorganizing and then sort of remodeling itself. And also there are uh, motors that can sort of, you know, intercept energy and then convert it into motion and forces. So it's a very uh, alive kind of, you know, skeleton and, 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 you know, much more alive and active than sort of, you know, normally what we are used to thinking about a skeleton. And then our tissues are also made up of like, you know, these similarly made up of network-like, uh, matrix-like uh, structures called the extracellular matrix. So both the cytoskeleton and the uh, ECM, the extracellular matrix, you can think of them as made up of uh, network-like structures, but these networks are very, very disordered, right? And so then if we want to study the mechanical properties or the rigidity of these network-like structures, you know, if you're a theorist like me, you might be like, okay, maybe we should try using, you know, percolation theory, in this case, rigidity percolation theory, because we are talking about, you know, the mechanics or, or you know, the squishiness of these things and see what that might help us understand, right? Well, one thing I wanted to say that if you have questions, feel free to stop me. I will, you know, if we don't get the full story, we don't get that. But I would rather take questions while you have them. So very briefly for, you know, at least the students in the audience, what is rigidity uh, percolation theory or rigidity percolation transition? So in this sort of, uh, 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 for this uh, kind of transition, what happens is basically think of your network and again, I'm a theorist, so I will think of things on a lattice because it's the simplest way to visualize things often, is think of a network on a lattice. So, you know, and you can think in, in a 2D lattice, it's basically you have infinitely large filaments that are sort of arranged in the form of a lattice. But, you know, in reality, our filaments are not infinitely large, right? So then if we want to have a finite distribution of filament lengths, the way to get that is to dilute this lattice and break some of the bonds, right? So now you have sort of a, a, you know, a wide distribution of filament lengths, and each filament is basically a series of collinear bonds, right? So that's what a filament is. We also say that any time sort of two filaments cross each other, there is a cross link, which will prevent them from sliding on top of each other like this, but they can rotate like this, so there is no energy cost of that, right? And the filaments have a cost of stretching them and a cost of bending them. So these are sort of the properties of these kinds of disordered networks. Now, if my network is very, very dilute, and I'm showing you a network which is on a Kagome lattice, right? And you can ask me later, why did I choose a Kagome lattice, not a square lattice or a triangular lattice? And I can tell you that. But uh, this is on a Kagome lattice. So if only 40% of my bonds were there, 
And if I now try to you know, apply mechanical stress, let's say shear on, on this lattice, it will basically not resist that shear. So it has a zero shear modulus. It's not rigid at all, right? So then I can increase the number of bonds. Uh, we call it floppy. We can have more bonds in it, let's say 50%. And you know, it's still, if I try to sort of you know, share it again, still has no rigidity. So I can keep increasing the fraction of bonds that are there in this lattice more and more and more. And what happens is when you go to 60% or a little bit more than 60%, then what we will have is it will be able to now sort of you know, resist the shear. We say that it can sort of you know, now percolate rigidity. So it's undergoing this phase transition, this mechanical phase transition from having a zero shear modulus to having a finite shear modulus when we are changing the fraction of bonds that are there in the lattice by a small amount, let's say in this case from 59% to a little over 60% or so, right? And system size, of course, has a, you know, de depending on how big my system is, things will change a little bit, the threshold and so on. And so in any phase transition, what happens when you tune something by a, like you know pressure temperature etc by a small amount a characteristic property of your system right in this case its rigidity will change by a large amount right so that's what's happening here so then and we can use this paradigm of rigidity uh, percolation transition to sort of help understand mechanics in in you know biological systems which you, which you can model as network like structures right so an example from you know, a long time ago when I was a, a postdoc, a, a brand new postdoc, are, 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 you know. so there were these experiments from Margaret Gardell from, again, this is 20, close to 20 years ago. And, and you know, what she saw is that if you take actin, so these are biopolymer networks that make up the cytoskeleton of cells. And if you take it out of the cell, and then you make an in vitro network of these materials in a Petri dish, and if you sort of now look at, if you vary the concentration of material in these networks, they undergo again, or you change the density of crosslinks, the modulus goes from you know, having sort of rigid, so you'll basically go from having a rigid network to a network that is not rigid, that is not going to be able to transmit mechanical stresses, right? And later on, uh, so I and my postdoc advisor, in this case, uh, Fred McIntosh and Alex Levine, and then other collaborators, we sh again showed that, yes, you can understand these kinds of things using rigidity percolation phase transition, where you can see that this uh, shear modulus, I'm calling it normalized modulus because I have divided it out, the shear modulus for a finite value of P by the shear modulus when all the bonds are there when P is one. So you can see that it's going, uh, and I'm showing this on a log linear scale to show the transition more sort of strikingly. It's going from having a finite value of this guy to zero, right? So this is where uh, this transition is happening. In this case, this is happening at 40 something percent because this was done on a triangular lattice. So where the transition is going to happen is going to ha depend on your dimensionality, but also the, you know, the type of lattice you have, the number of nearest neighbors, those kinds of things, right? So, so, this, so these kinds of systems can be understood using this kind of a percolation framework. That was the point of showing this. Okay, so, and this was what will happen if you have a network made up of only one type of filamentous material, which is what they were, you know, people were doing. They were building in vitro, you know, networks made up of purified actin or purified some biopolymer component, et cetera. But in actual cells or tissues, these networks are all, all often multi-component, right? So in cytoskeleton, for example, you have actin and microtubules, right? In the extracellular matrix, you might have collagen and then you know, another second network of hyaluronic acid and proteoglycan. So in that sense, these are composite materials or multi-component or composite networks, right? So if we really want to understand what's going on in these materials, we have to take into account the fact that these are composite or multi-component materials. And the simplest model that we can sort of you know, write down for these kinds of systems is again, we can do a rigidity percolation theory, but now in a simple uh, two component network or what we call what is known in the field as a double network, right? So basically you have two different networks. And in this case, you can have a network which is sort of stiff interacting with a network that is flexible, right? And both of them are the lattice uh, base networks that I showed you earlier. So for the stiff network, and let's say if you're thinking of this in the context of, of you know, your network in your tissues, then the stiff network would be like something like collagen fibers, which are very stiff, and the softer network would be a network of 
uh, hyaluronic acid and, and uh, proteoglycans together, which is much softer. So the stiff network, you can see that I have written down two terms here. So the first term is basically coming from the energy of stretching uh, bonds, and then the sum over, oops, no. OK, uh, yeah, so and I'm summing over. So again, you know, if you want to think of stretching energy for the, the whole network, you're going to sum over all the bonds that are part of the network, right? And the P here basically tells you whether a bond is there or not, right? For it to, you know, uh, basically contribute to the deformation energy, this thing has to be there, right? So this is the stretching sort of contribution. And this is basically the rigidity associated with stretching. And then this is a part which comes from the bending. And bending is basically is a three-body term. So anytime you have a pair of bonds, you know, which were initially making a 180 degree angle with each other, and now they have sort of changed this angle, so there will be a bending rigidity for that. So we are only thinking about filament bending, uh, filament bending, right, for, you know, and not bending between crossing fibers, et cetera. So this is for the stiff network. For the flexible network, there is no, uh, you know, energy cost of bending the fibers. There is some energy cost of stretching the fibers, but this energy cost is much, much smaller. And then the two networks sort of interact with each other, uh, you know, through weak Hookean springs, right? So this is sort of the model. So the way we calculate the shear modulus is you can apply shear strain at the boundaries, right? And then you can sort of minimize the energy if you're doing things computationally. You can minimize the energy and you can calculate, you can find out what is the minimum energy configuration, right? And then, you know, if you want to find out the stress in the network, you will take the first derivative of the, you know, energy with respect to strain. If you want to find out the modulus, it's going to be the second derivative and so on, right? And if you're at very, very small strains, you're looking at linear response, then you don't even need to calculate these derivatives. You can basically look at the energy densities, right? And, and calculate the, you know, the linear shear modulus from that. And then what we found with a model like this, okay, before I go on, are there any questions on the model for the students in the audience, especially? Okay, you guys will stop me if you have questions, okay. So then what we find, so this is essentially what we are doing, right? So now I'm again showing you the normalized shear modulus as a function of, you know, the fraction of bonds that are there in the network. And the x-axis is the fraction of bonds that are there in the sort of stiff network. And the different colors correspond to the, the you know, bond occupation of the flexible network or the fraction of bonds that are there in the flexible network. And one of the things that you can see is that the amount of you know, bonds in the flexible network and the stiff network both sort of matter, right, when we are thinking about what is the rigidity of this composite network, which you we can guess that, yes, that definitely should be uh, the case. but. Uh, you can see that the percolation thresholds, the thresh, like the point at which the double network goes from being rigid to non-rigid, that depends on, on you know, how much material is there in the second network. So if there was only the stiff network, you know, we would have needed a lot of material in the stiff network to be, you know, for the whole thing to be rigid. If there are, you know, uh, more and more material in the, in the flexible network, this is kind of, you know, the, percolation threshold for the stiff network is going to move. That's important. But the other more important thing from a biology point of view is the following. So I've uh, drawn these two dashed lines as your guide, as our guide to the eye, right? Why? So here, right, in this case, we are just barely above this rigidity transition threshold for a single filament network, right, which was around 60%, right? And here, if you see, you see that if, you, if I vary the amount of material in the flexible network, this modulus varies by several orders of magnitude, right? But on the other hand, if I'm here where my network is very, very dense, the stiff network is very dense, right, like close to 90%, now if I vary P2, you can see that there is very little sort of change in the modulus. And one of the ways this relates to our tissues, and we will, I will talk about this a little bit later, is let's say if you think of our cartilage tissue, and you know, so this is a three-dimensional tissue, right? And, and, you know, and the density of fibers in this tissue is different if you're closer to the bone versus if you're closer to the joint. So closer to the joint, you know, the density of fibers is such that you will be in this regime. So even if you lose a little amount of material from the secondary network, 
that can make a huge difference to the tissue and it can fail easily. But closer to the bone, the stiff collagen network is super dense, so it doesn't really matter if we are diluting the aggregate or the other part a little bit. So, so these kinds of things matter. Where you are in this phase space can be really, really important in, in, in biological systems. So, and so I already talked a little bit about the application of this kind of, you know, having a composite network in, in you know, biopolymer-based uh, uh, systems. And one example is, is uh, tissues like uh, cart our cartilage tissue. So special, spe specifically, I'm talking about articular cartilage, which is this thin tissue which is present in our joints, in our knees and elbows. And it's only a few millimeters thick, but it can help us carry loads or weights that are up to 10 times our body's weight, right? And this cartilage, it's made up of, again, a stiff network of collagen and a flexible network of hyaluronic acid and aggregate and so on. And the thing about cartilage is that, you know, it's, it's all, all of it is extracellular matrix, right? So it's not an alive thing, but this extracellular matrix is made by cells. And when we are all young, when you know you are all young, and even for those of you who are undergrads or grad students, your cartilage still has a lot of cells which are making new ECM. But once you cross your mid-30s, and then you know you are in our situation, your cartilage doesn't have very many of these cells left. So you're not making new cartilage anymore. You might be making scar tissue, but not new functional cartilage. So whatever cartilage you are left with has to last you for the rest of your lifetime. And then during the rest of your lifetime, the remaining decades, your jo joints are undergoing several hundred million loading cycles, right? So your tissue has to be really tough and robust. It has to be adaptive, but cannot really, should not be brittle, right? Should not fall apart easily because you are all of the activities we are doing, you know, walking, jumping, a lot of you are hiking. Some of you are, you know, part of the dance club and so on. So your cartilage is under going through a lot of stress during these things. So it has to be really robust. So then you can ask, well, why, what are the physics rules or principles that make our cartilage both sort of, you know, adaptive and robust, et cetera? And then, you know, as we get older, you know, there can be some degeneration in the tissue, uh, loss of material due to, you know, either mechanical trauma or biochemical degradation. So when this loss happens, you know, can we make predictions, right? When we will need surgical intervention, when we will not need surgical intervention, what will that pathway of mechanical function look like, right, when there is loss of material. And it's a little bit difficult. It's not an easy problem to sort of, you know, uh, address a priori because, again, like I was telling you, this tissue is three-dimensional, and it's not homogeneous throughout the depth of the tissue, right? Like some parts of the tissue, the networks are very dense. Some parts of the tissue, they are quite sparse. So there is that, and, and also, you know, the, so there is this, the mechanics itself is also quite depth dependent, and then, you know, the properties are also quite nonlinear, right? And like I was telling you earlier in the previous uh, figure I showed you, depending on where you're losing material, if you lose material here, nothing much will happen, but if you lose material here, you can see that the shear modulus can change by several orders of magnitude and might get you close to failure, et cetera. So, so we wanted to have a framework to understand, you know, sort of the biophysics or the physics of, of you know, why cartilage is robust and, and tough. And so how do we build this network? And so this work is in collaboration with uh, Itai Cohen uh, at Cornell University. He's in, he does physics experiments, and Larry Bonasser, who is in tissue engineering. And so the way we start is we basically, let's say, take healthy cartilage tissue, right, and measure the shear modulus of this tissue as a function of its constituents. In this case, the constituents are how much collagen does it have, collagen concentration, and how much aggregate, which is the flexible, you know, this other uh, net network, how much aggregate does it have? It's the major component of that. And we can measure the shear modulus. So this gives us some data point. Then we can go to a different part of the parameter space, and we can use an enzyme to digest away all of the second network, right? And then measure sort of, again, the shear modulus. So now you have a tissue with only collagen and you're measuring the shear modulus. Then we want to sort of come up with a theory or model that can sort of explain these two data sets. And then we can sort of extrapolate this theory or model to generate the whole surface so that if my damage was following a different pathway, I should be able to predict uh, what's happening, right? So we use the model that I just showed you, but you know, with some other tweaks. 
uh, uh, to sort of generate this surface, right? So, so that we can explain this, you know. So the way we do it, and there are some unknown, you know, phenomenological parameters. So what we do is we first uh, try to fit our model to the data for the healthy cartilage. Then we make sure that the same model, the same parameters will also fit the data for the cartilage where we have digested away all of the second network and only collagen is there, right? And then we sort of extrapolate the surface to generate the whole theory prediction. So now, you know, we have these different parts of the face space when we have only like, you know, very sparse collagen, there is no aggregate, a dense network of collagen, there is aggregate, and uh, there is also no aggregate, and then, you know, we have dense network of collagen and aggregate, and sparse network of collagen and aggregate. So one thing I didn't tell you so far, you might be like, well, seems like this network is 2D, but the tissue is 3D. How is she doing this? How are they doing this? So because the network is, is uh, sort of, you know, the density of fibers, is ch the concentration of, of, you know, the fibers is changing as a function of depth, instead of modeling a, a full-on three-dimensional network, what we did is, like in your experiments, you will have Z stacks, which are 2D slices. We think of our network as a series of 2D slices. And then each slice has a, a you know, a measured concentration of how much collagen is there for this 2D slice, how much aggregate concentration is there for this 2D slice. So then we have a series of 2D networks at, at different depths of the tissue. So that's what we are doing. Now there is a, a, you know, we are making assumptions, right? We are, this way, we are sort of neglecting any kind of interaction, right, in this direction. So that is, a, you know, a assumption that we have made, but it seems, and right now we are doing a full-on 3D model, but at least this was sort of, in order to get an initial understanding of what's going on this, uh, in this tissue, it seemed like thinking of the three-dimensional system as a series of 2D slices with different concentrations of aggregate and, and you know, uh, collagen was okay, right? So, so then, you know, what we have now is we have a model that's based on composition, you know, so we can predict the shear modulus as a function of aggregate and collagen, and, you know, I showed you, like, you know, so not only will this model, you know, sort of, agree, like, explain what's going on for the data points here, for other, if you had disease pathways that went in this direction or this direction, we still have some predictions from this. And the good thing is that, you know, so from sort of MRI measurements, et cetera, from damaged tissue, we will know what is the composition like, how much collagen is there, how much aggregate is there, right, in a patient's tissue. And then we might be able to make some predictions about, you know, depending on the concentration of these various things, what, would, what kind of mechanical, uh, you know, properties would we predict for these kinds of, of tissues. And although I did this for, you know, cartilage, which has a lot of collagen, you know, it's a very collagen-rich tissue, there are other collagenous tissues where maybe it's a little bit like, you know, there is not as much collagen, for example. Nouris and I were talking about the vitreous gel in our eyes, which is another tissue which has collagen and hyaluronic acid, et cetera, but the composition is very different. So that would have, again, you know, the, it will not be this phase diagram because the fitting parameters and the constants and other things that came in are different, right? and the type of collagen is different, but this kind of framework will still be useful for other kinds of, you know, collagenous soft tissues, right? And we can also take these kinds of, you know, uh, double network or multi-component network models and add motors to them and contractility and sort of, you know, uh, predict the uh, mechanical response of actomycin networks with motors and so on, which is also something we have done. I'm not going to get into that, but if you have questions, uh, we can talk about this later. But before we go any further, I will see if you guys have any questions on this part. If not, I'm happy to move on because we are running, running uh, short on time. So then I was talking about this robustness and resilience part earlier, right? And I was talking about, you know, stentor, which is really mechanically robust and cannot be damaged easily. Another way uh, people look at robustness uh, more systematically is, is, you know, if you want to look at crack growth in your cartilage tissue, often the way that's studied is you will make a notch, uh, you know, in your tissue and then you'll apply a stretching force and then see how this notch is growing. Will it lead to, you know, uh, all-out brittle fracture or what's going to happen? And in this case, you can see that it's sort of, 
the crack here blunts and the bottom is sort of pulling out a little, right? So in our double network model, again, we can see something like this for certain choice of parameters. And in this case, the way this model is different from the previous model, previous version of the model, is there we were not allowing our bonds to break or buckle. But now we are saying that if a bond has been stretched too much, right, it's been stretched more than the amount of strain it can take, uh, which we call its ultimate tensile uh, uh, threshold, it can break, and bonds that have been compressed too much can also buckle. And for those kinds of situations, we can end up with, you know, uh, if we start with a notch, we can study how this notch is going to grow, if there is going to be, you know, if the, the crack or the notch is going to propagate or not propagate, and, and so on, right? So, so I'm showing you two situations here. Once again, when my stiff network is just like, remember these two dashed lines I was showing you earlier. In one case, we were just above the rigidity threshold. And the other case, we were very, very dense, far above the rigidity threshold. If my stiff network is super dense and super constrained, right, then what happens is if I, amount, if I change the amount of material in the flexible network, if I look at the stress strain graph of the system, you see that things don't really change very much, right? So initially, the stress increases as I am stretching, uh, stretching the material, right? Because, you know, the, like the amount of, you know, uh, uh, as I'm stretching this material, the system is, is going to sort of feel more and more and more of, of the stress, right? It grows, and then it reaches a maximum, then it starts falling, because if I've stretched too, mu too much, then bonds will start breaking and buckling, right? But if the stiff network is very dense, it doesn't matter what's going on in the flexible network, they're all going to crash at the same point. However, if the stiff network is just above its percolation threshold, it's you know, not super dense, it's de dense enough so that it can sort of uh, transmit mechanical forces, then the amount of material in the flexible network really matters, right? And you can see that the strains at which things start failing is different, et cetera. So I can also just plot the peak stress, uh, you know, and, and uh, the strain at maximum stress. So the main thing is the strain at maximum stress. You can see that if the network, network was very stiff, which is, you know, uh, P1 equals 80%, so 80% of the bonds are there, it's very rigid and very well connected, then it doesn't matter what I'm doing with the second network. But in this case, as I add more and more material in the second network, the sort of strain at which it will start failing, it goes down. For the maximum stress though, both of these things go up. So what is happening here? So if I add, let's say you have a network, which is the stiff network. As you add more and more material in the flexible network, you're adding more and more mechanical reinforcement, right? So it makes sense that the stress is going to go up, right? But if you really want a tough and robust material, it's not enough that you want a material that can bear a lot of stress. You also want a material that will not fail easily. But when you think about failure, something else comes into play. If your network has a lot of constraints, if you add more and more material to the second network, you're adding a lot of constraints, which is sort of suppressing low energy reorganizations of the network, right? So if you add too much constraint, it doesn't really allow the network to sort of reconfigure and remodel easily, right? So, so, this, so basically, having too much material in the second network is, is going to you know, interfere with that, right? It will make the material less extensible. So if you really want something which is both you know, load bearing, but at the same time will not fail easily, there is this trade off, right? There is this sweet spot you want the stiff network to be, you know, well enough connected so that it can bear and propagate mechanical stresses, right? But you don't want it super well connected, super rigid, right? So that, you know, it will break, like the only way it can sort of, you know, relax accumulated stresses is by breaking off bonds and, and you know, you get brittle fracture. You will want it to be, you know, just above the percolation threshold, but also in the flexible network, you will not maybe want too much material in the flexible network. You'll only want as much material as is necessary for you know, your load bearing capability of the material, but you will allow again like some slack or some non-affine deformations, right? So, so there is this kind of trade-off between these guys. And, and the last bit about this network part was that you know, so far I've talked about, and most studies that people have done 
are on homogeneous networks, where your entire sort of all the filamentous networks are spatially uniform everywhere, right? But the way tissues are made or tissues are degraded, your network is not going to be uniform. So this is basically showing you, you know, how sort of these chondrocytes in cartilage tissue make new cartilage. And, and you know, there is going to be more network in places, you know, because cells are also not uniformly, you know, distributed and the, the way they make networks, there will be more filamentous material in some places, less in some, some places, right, right? So there is going to be quite a bit of spatial inhomogeneity. So for the same amount of filamentous material, your, you know, material can be clustered together or it can be, you know, like completely uniformly spread, right? And what we find here is that, you know, if your network is clustered together, you can often get a rigid material with sort of less amount of filamentous material, right? So the percolation threshold initially goes down, right? As you increase the concentration, as you increase the degree of correlation, the connectedness or clustering in your, in your system, initially the percolation threshold will go down because with a smaller amount of material, you can still have a path for stress propagation. However, if your network is too clustered, too correlated, then you can have disconnected islands, right? So too much correlation is also not good. So once again, there is kind of a sweet spot if you're thinking of correlations in your system, right? So all of these things are, are basically, you know, it's not like uni uh, monotonic change in properties, but there are these regions or windows, you know, that biology utilizes where things are, are sort of useful, right? So I'm going to switch to a completely different thing now because I was mostly talking about static mechanical properties, and I'm going to talk about things that are more dynamic, but uh, are there questions you guys have so far? Can we wait one minute? Yes. So I guess here what we are assuming is either you're in the linear elastic regime where, you know, it's completely, uh, like there is no hysteresis, no memory, anything, you apply the force or stress, it deforms, you take away the stress, it comes back completely, right? But then for these things, when we have breaking and buckling, those are plastic events, right? So those are, so there we are assuming that once, once uh, you know, uh, fiber has been extended by a certain amount, which is more than, in case of collagen, we were assuming that if it has been, uh, you know, stretched for more than twice, like if it has been stretched to a length, which is more than twice its original length or something, then it's going to break, right? Once it's broken, it's gone, right? But if something is buckled, then if you take away the compression, compressive force which is buckling it, it can come back to circulation. So in actual biological systems, if so long as the, it's elastic deformation, it will come back. But if it's plastic deformation, then, you know, there will be some memory, right? And depending on the extent, it can be completely gone or you will see some hysteresis, right? So only a part of the function will be often. Meredith. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. So in cartilage, not so much because when, so for adult cartilage, like those of us who are above 35, our cartilage has very few cells left. So there is not a lot of remodeling by the cells going on in our cartilage. But for your undergrads or early grad students, it's probably important. Yeah, so not so much for cart. So for cartilage, that doesn't happen so much. But the other system that I talked about, the actomyosin, which I didn't go into detail, there of course it's motors and things can change, right? So and and you know these kinds of models have some assumptions. Every model is a toy model, right? And has its own assumptions. So there are some assumptions we are making in this case. But these things will be more important when you have things like motors and activity, or sometimes your shining light and you're shining light on one part of the network and activating motors in one part of the network, sometimes you might be activating motors in a different part of the network and those kinds of things, right? Yes? So 
so we are already starting with a notch. But you can also do a simulation where you don't start with a notch, and then you see how things will break, right? So here what we were doing is we were starting with a notch to mimic the kind of experiments where people do notch tests. No, 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 no. Flexible networks will break. Can, can be stretched. I can go back to, I might have, yeah, let me see. I might have it. Yeah, so sorry, I said something different. So if the stiff network, the bonds can be stretched to 120% of their original length, much less than what I said, before they will break. For flexible network, they can be stretched to 200% of their original length before they can break. And we can make these assumptions based on our knowledge of what is the ultimate tensile threshold for these kinds of fibers, right? So some things we know about them. We know the persistence length of some of these filaments. We know the ultimate thre tensile thresholds for some of these filaments. Things we don't know, we don't really have that much knowledge about, we have some idea of the range of hyaluronic acids, shear modulus, like where in you know Pascal's range it is, but we don't have exact numbers. But collagen is better studied, and we have better knowledge of collagen properties, et cetera. Yes? Yeah. Right. So in this model, we were not assuming how it's changing the clustering. We are assuming that this is not doing anything to the clustering, right? So. So the thing is, you can, so we are saying that it's digesting. We are only confining ourselves to the part of the system, to the part of the tissue. I'm not showing you the experimental data. So up to about, uh, so uh, up to a part of the tissue, it will digest away all of the aggregate. And then deeper down, it will only digest part of the aggregate. We are concentrating on the part of the tissue where it has digested away all of the aggregate. But if we had gone to a little bit deeper, where you know it was only digesting part of the aggregate, then the kind of clustering stuff you're talking about would be important. But we are focusing on the part of the tissue where no all aggregate is gone, and and you know only collagen is left. Right. I mean the enzyme is only you know you're putting enzyme from the top of the tissue, right? So it will go down up to a part of the tissue. It's digesting away all of the aggregate. Then after that, it has only digested away some of the aggregate, but not all, right? Because that's how is the enzyme is getting taken up by the, by the material, right? All right, so then the second part, notice how much time I have, do I have? So about 10 minutes. Okay, I'm going to try to tell this story. This is in some ways, so all of the other stuff I told you before is published, but this is work that is currently under review, and, and, and you know, I wanted to tell you about that, and some of this we are doing now. So everything I told, talked about so far was a sort of static mechanical property, right? But what about dynamics? So most of the time when we think about active materials, we take a network of actin or microtubules, et cetera, we add motors to it, and, you know, and then things contract, and we get some state. But then that's kind of a state, and the system, we can't really recover back our system, right? In cells, however, cells are constantly you know, getting between different states, right? So we wanted to build something like that, and so the picture in our head was basically, we want to combine these kinds of polymers from you know, cells, from the cytoskeleton of cells like actin and microtubule, with uh, circadian pr proteins from cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria have the circadian proteins called chi ABC, and these proteins have a 24-hour cycle. So on a 24-hour cycle, you know, at this peak, they will form a, you know, a complex, a hexameric a complex like this, and then you know, in the trough region, they're all sort of separated, right? They're not connected to each other. And our idea was that, okay, we will take these chi ABC things, and then we will coat a fraction of our chi ABCs with biotin streptavidin, and then we will also uh, you know, coat a fraction of our materials with biotin streptavidin, so that in this part of the cycle, they will sort of act as cross-linkers for our material, but here they will not uh, act as cross-linkers for our material. So that is sort of our mental picture. 
But this is a very complicated system, so we decided, okay, before we try things with biopolymers, we'll try things with colloids instead of biopolymers, right? So then this is sort of what we are now, what we then thought of is that, again, you have this chi A, chi B, chi C from the uh, circadian clock of cyanobacteria. By the way, we all have circadian clocks. We know this, right? And you know, sometimes our metabolism is very fast, right? Like right now, and when we sleep, our metabolism is not fast, right? Our clocks sort of regulate those kinds of things. Same thing for all living things, right? So chi A, chi A, chi B, chi C are sort of responsible for the circadian clocks in cyanobacteria, right? And like I was telling you, on this 24-hour cycle, they will all form a complex together, or they will not form a complex together. They are separated out. And we can coat some of the chi Bs with biotin like this. We also coat some our colloids with biotin. And then, you know, the goal is if to see if we can go between these kinds of states, right, where the colloids are disconnected versus the colloids are connected in a network, and then do this sort of reversibly and repeatedly. Can we get something like this, right? Now, before we actually add colloids, et cetera, uh, my experimental colleagues wanted to see what happens when you actually biotinylate chi ABC, right? So that's the first thing. How will it change function? So if you take uh, chi ABC and you do not biotinylate any of them, so 0% of them are biotinylated, all is wild type, you see these kinds of oscillations, right? So as you would expect, right? So in, 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 you know, and the oscillations, basically the peaks mean that they're forming these chi ABC complexes. The troughs mean that the, these are free, right? They're not sort of connected altogether. Now you biotinylate 55% of the chi ABCs, you still see oscillations, but there is attenuation. You, uh, um, you know, biotinylate 80% of the chi ABCs, and then the